All right. Hi, guys. Um, so we are going to talk about the case summarizer today. Um, and this is a follow-up to our previous uh, video recording on, uh, on the semantics-based compiler, where Shahong and I talked about um, the beginnings and uh, what motivated the work and how we thought back then, in, back in 2017 or so, that it should be done. But uh, five years passed and, um, and uh, lots of progress has been made on, on the problem. And uh, we found a more general way to deal with it, also cleaner, as it often happens when you <laughs> work on nice problems. Um, and uh, today we have here uh, Everett and Nishant, both of them are working on the case summarizer. And uh, let's start with the basics. What is the case summarizer and where we want to go and see a demo. And uh, hopefully we can uh, meet many of you um, in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the case summarizer, as was mentioned in the last video, um, is kind of the newest iteration in this long research trend of finding a way to derive a compiler from a semantics. And as was stated before, that wasn't the original goal. Um, you know, the original goal was more aligned with the idea of like partial evaluation, right? And so somehow now we're talking about partial evaluation of a semantics instead of partial evaluation of a specific program. And so when you step, when you zoom out and look at it from that perspective, things get simpler and more complicated, right? But mostly they get simpler, I think, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, the idea- And more general. Here, huh? Yeah. More and more general, general, which is- Yeah, important. more widely applicable. Yeah. Um, but the idea is, you know, you should have a way to get a closed form description of all the behaviors of a program with minimal extra input above and beyond the semantics itself. Uh, ideally, no input above and beyond the semantics itself, but that- we haven't been able to achieve that yet for real world languages, but we have been able to achieve minimal input, which is on the order of a hundred lines of, of Python code, basically providing those hints. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what the summarizer's goal is, is to, is to with minimal of input above a language operational semantics, derive a compiler for that language, which produces for you optimized binaries, optimized semantics that, uh, implements the specific program you're looking at. That's one. What, what is really nice about it and uh, the way it evolved from when we initially looked at the problem is that now you can generate an actual K semantics <laughs> from the program. So you take a program, a language semantics, uh, semantics of a language. Now you take a program in that language and that's why we call it K summarizer because it summarizes all the behaviors of that program as much as you can using the semantics. So it's like compilers do, but semantics driven, which is, uh, it's just amazing. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. And this actually enables quite a bit uh, in terms of how you think about, well, it, it changes the way you think about what a compiler is, is the first thing it does, but it also enables quite a bit in terms of like, if what you're, if what we were spitting out, you know, we take a, a language and a program in the language, if what we were spitting out was an artifact in some other language or some other formalism, we wouldn't be able to, for example, iterate the process, right? But now because we're taking a K definition and a program and spitting out a new K definition, anything we can do with a K definition, we can do with this new K definition, right? Including minimizing it, reducing parts of the state that it's mentioning, removing rules from it, all the same analysis that we have over normal K definitions, we have over this one as well. Yes, so not only execution, faster execution, but also formal verification, optimized formal verification, optimized model checking, optimized uh, space, uh, state space exploration. Basically everything that you want to do with a semantics, now you can do better, faster. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I really like about this new method is that it kind of enables uh, formal invariants to um, get, get us more optimized code in, uh, even when doing non-verified applications like just execution. So yeah, we can basically leverage. Uh, yeah, because people, people typically, yes, mm -hmm. that's a very important point because people typically think of formal verification as something heavy, something hard mm -hmm. that you do just to increase um, the trust in the code. 
Very few people think of formal verification as a way to optimize your code, to make it faster, better. Yeah. <laughs> Which is and nice. also people think of the optimization problem as something where you specify the optimization you want to do and try to verify its correctness after the fact. And we're taking it, we're completely flipping that around, right? <laughs> we're saying do a verification first, and then you know it's you know your optimization is correct. And Combine that with basically our strategies for which, uh, what we think is a complete strategy for doing this summarization, right? And you don't even have to do a verification up front. The, the, the tool is discovering the verification it needs to do for you, doing the verification and then doing the optimization. So it's kind of like automatic correct by construction compilation, which is pretty cool. Um, I could run through a, a small example. Yes, let's, uh, let's look at an example um, in whichever language you prefer, and then maybe show us the same example in another language, just to show the language uh, parametricity, uh, strength of the framework. And then we can uh, get back to high-level discussions and um, think a bit about the future of this project. What are the challenges are for others who may want to help us, and uh, what we want to do in the immediate future, and want to do, what we want to do long term. So, all right. So the, the first thing I wanna go with is we're, we're talking about taking a language and a program and producing a new language, a new K definition that only is able to execute that program. It's kind of what a compiler does, right? A compiler takes a semantics that's encoded in some programming language as the compiler, like GCC. It somehow is encoding a semantics of C and takes a C program and produces a binary that only is able to interpret that original C program, right? We're doing the same thing here, uh, but the language that I wanna show that we're starting with is this one called EVM, which is the Ethereum virtual machine. It's a stack language. And the, the key thing to, to see is, okay, we have this configuration here, it's pretty big. You know, a lot of state that has to be maintained uh, for doing EVM execution. And then there's a whole bunch of, I'm just gonna scroll through it quickly so you can see, you know, there's a whole bunch of rules present in the EVM semantics defining the transition system that is executing a, an EVM program, right? So it's it's quite large, right? Um, it's not like as large as C, but it's a real world uh, language, which means that it has to deal with real world things. It has to deal with actual memory models and talking to other programs and stuff like that, right? So that can be that can make it quite large. So that's our language that we have as input. Now we want to talk about the program that we have as input. And the, the program I'm going to use is this one called sum to n. It's basically just a single function that computes the sum up to this n of this loop, right? And there's a couple of solidity specific things. The, the source language here is called solidity, but this compiles down to EVM bytecode, which is then executable with this semantics, for example, right? And the resulting summary, what it looks like is, is like this, right? And so here you have a single, you know, before in the semantics, when you were executing the sum to n program, you had to take 649k steps. And by, uh, sorry for the interruption, Everett, but this is all done by the tool that uh, that yeah. um, that is already implemented, right? So it's not like uh, generated by hand or with scripts or with anything. It's just the actual tool. That's how it works right now. Right. Fully automatic, like no, no user input needed beyond what I've already supplied for the whole semantics. That's a one time for that semantics supplying of that user input. It's language specific. It's not program specific input. Um, That's yeah. very nice. I mean, this was so hard to do. We didn't even know how to approach it a few years back. So now it's so nice to, to have all this degree of automation. Yeah, yeah, we had quite a few failures, basically, or or things that were almost successes, but they weren't uh, they weren't quite robust enough. Um, but the K tool has developed a lot in that time, you know, and there's been a lot of uh, tooling advancements that have enabled this. So, um, yes. but so for example, our our sum program, if we were to you know summarize this as a control flow graph, we would say, okay, there's one basic block that takes us from you know the beginning of the function to the head of the while loop. And then there's another basic block that executes the while loop n number of times. And then there's a basic block that takes us from the end of the while loop to the end of the program. And that's exactly what we see in this summary is we have one basic block, which originally is 649K steps, taking us from the function entry to the beginning of the while loop. And you can see here, we have a, you know, a, K, a new K rule that implements that basic block, right? It goes from program counter zero to 112, for example. And then we have one for the loop body, which is right here. 
So this is one iteration of the loop, okay? And then we have another one for the terminal part of the, the execution, which is right here. And so this is to take you from the end of the loop to the end of execution of the program. And so we ran some initial experiments with this and the results were really promising. We're seeing, you know, on the order of two orders of magnitude speed up of verification times for this program. So we tried just really using just a dumb verification strategy of just loop unrolling, right? We executed some to 10, some to 100, some to 1,000, some to 10,000. You can see those executions here. So we have some to one, some to 10, some to 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. And with the original program, the original semantics, we only ran these two sums. But with the optimized one, we can get up to this one in the same amount of time, basically. Uh, so you get this pretty large performance gain in the verification. But that same performance gain is also for your concrete execution, for any other tools. And then the other thing that I think is pretty cool is this enables static analysis, right? Because we can do, uh, you know, normally when we're talking about K and operational semantics, we're talking about dynamic analysis, right? We're talking about dynamic verification. We're actually doing symbolic execution. This is a complete and concise con summary of all the behaviors of the program. You could easily write a def use routine, for example, over this summary, right? You could write a taint analysis. All the things that you think of doing with static analysis, you can do over this summary instead of over some other tool that does an ad hoc on parsing, parsing of the program and understanding of what the program is doing. Now you get a precise description that you can base your analysis on. And just to, uh, you, I know you mentioned earlier on another, you know, showing it for another language, but here we have. But know, but uh, let's 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 uh, get back to one thing that you mentioned, uh, which I think is very important. So this performance increase right, that we get. So when you execute the summarized program, right, using the same execution infrastructure, right, you are orders of magnitude faster. Two orders, yeah. Two orders of magnitude faster. This is also common in other settings, um, other languages where you have an interpreter versus a compiler, like LLVM, for example, it's also like between two and three orders of magnitude. So when you generate actual native code versus when you interpret the LLVM bit code, you have two or three orders of magnitude uh, performance. And um, this actually gives us <laughs> quite a good compiler for EVM. I think so. Um, and that people can use off offline to, to do better testing, faster testing, to do lots of things, verification, analysis. So it's so many, gives us so many benefits. Um, yeah. It's even hard to enumerate all of them because there are so many benefits. It's just yeah. uh, amazing that we can do all this. Yeah, and it really enables, I mean, it, the, the big thing it enables for EVM, because EVM, I would say, is like a mid-sized language or maybe small to mid-sized language. C is a large language, right? But for EVM, it takes proof time from the order of hours to the order of minutes. That changes it from the realm of being not useful to do proofs at development time to being actually I'm willing to wait a couple minutes to get that higher level of assurance at development time, in addition to the concrete execution speed up <laughs> benefits you get as well. It's nice that we can talk uniformly about all these things, right? So people very rarely talk about efficient compilation, efficient execution, and formal verification, and proofs. And now they're all together because they are all together. So, yeah, and somehow that should be an indicator that we're doing it the right way, you know? Like it, right, it should exactly. be that you, that you get to optimize once and somehow all the tools benefit, right? And you fix a bug somewhere. Suppose that we have an error in the semantics or that EVM evolves from version n to version n plus one, then we just make a change in the semantics, which right, should right. be of EVM, and then push buttons and generate uh, everything <laughs> from there. So yeah. change things in one place as opposed to n places. Yeah, 100%, I agree. Um, right. I just wanted to show one more execution, which is this imp execution. Actually, uh, Nishant, who's on the call, um, is the one who did the work of making sure this would work with imp as well. And uh, I mean, it's, I just want to show you, okay, it's the same thing. It's the sum to n program, right? Um, which is here, you know, int n sum is zero. And then we're summing up to n with this while loop. And it ends up, you know, inferring the same control flow graph structure. It looks slightly different because of some details of how the imp language is, but it's the, it's the same graph structure. You know, you're stepping to the while loop, you have iterations of the while loop and then stepping out. And once again, fully automatic, no user input needed for this program to get this summary. 
for imp because we're only summarizing you know on the order of tens of steps at a time the optimization is less right but for kvm where you're summarizing on the order of hundreds of steps like the basic blocks are on the order of hundreds of steps the optimization is more and for larger languages where the basic blocks are going to be even bigger i think you'll get even more optimization so i think this is a something where it pays off even more for bigger languages yeah and this is pretty close to how you would write the sum program in k if you were to do it yeah um, and 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 you know if we step back and look at the big picture particular programming languages become just syntactic sugar for writing behaviors <laughs> of what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And those behaviors in the end um, are nicely abstracted and executed efficiently. So there are so many benefits. All right, so now let's step back a bit and think about immediate short-term challenges here and then long-term um, Achievements. What would what what would what what do you think are the let's say the what is the most basic immediate limitation that we have and where we could use some help from the community if uh, if people are interested in helping? Um, well, I, two things come to mind immediately. The first one is um, right now there is some use there's some language specific user input that's needed, right, and mm -hmm. that uh, is in the form of telling us basically what loops look like, what branches look like, and what terminal states in your language look like, those three things. And so we've already gotten a way to make that input as compact as possible, but maybe we don't need all that input. Maybe we don't need to know what loops look like or what branches look like in your language. Maybe that's inferable somehow. I don't know. And then yeah. another thing that is maybe challenging is somehow when we're doing this closed form summarization, we're inferring when we hit a loop, we're inferring kind of the weakest loop invariant associated with that loop, right? It's the it's the loop invariant of, you know, just normal execution. It's not a loop invariant that's tailored to a specific property. You know, it's not like we're trying to verify the sum property. It's just one execution of the loop. And then you get back to the left-hand side and you're back in a state that is invariant in the sense that every time you hit the that, that loop head, you're gonna hit that state, right? So, yeah maybe stronger invariant inference that's tailored mm -hmm. to the specific property you need to verify for that execution. I think this is going to be important mm -hmm. long-term because- Exactly, long-term. Yeah, yep. because the, there's, there's algorithms that people are writing that don't have closed form solutions for the loop. If you do have a closed form solution to the loop, then you should just do a proof that it's a closed form solution to the loop. You can use the summarizer to assist you with this proof. Mm -hmm. and then replace the original code with the closed form solution, right? There's no yeah. reason to have the loop there anymore. Yes. But if you don't have a closed form solution, we still want to get some benefit out of it. You might, it might be that you have, it might be that you don't have a closed form solution of the loop, but you have some error bounds on what the loop ends up. And you want to verify that. Okay, we need stronger and varying inference to be able to verify those error bounds automatically somehow from this weakest loop invariant to, the, to a slightly stronger one that gives you that, that slightly stronger statement. So I'm not super well versed in that, so I don't know. But I mean, to me, it sounds like a challenge, right? Yes, yes, yes. Right. And actually there is a lot of research on invariant inference, which now can be brought to or lifted to the level of a, of a semantics and apply to all languages. Um, if, if this you know, field goes where we believe it will, you know, we'll soon be at a point where compilers as we know them today may not be necessary anymore because yeah. we can generate them from the semantics. And in terms of um, widespread adoption of, of the new way of doing things, um, I, I, I believe that once we can show numbers that uh, performance actually can be significantly improved if you go this path, I think uh, the community will um, will will accept uh, the new approach. I remember uh, there were similar issues with Clang versus GCC. So Clang implemented uh, techniques to do inductive invariance inference, very simple patterns. But once they did that, they could take programs like the sum of one to n and do it in constant time, which is you know, meaning that you summarize the the, the loop and uh, and get a closed form solution. And, and, and uh, I remember many, many C developers were like, what? That is not possible. How can you execute in constant time this program? Um, and um, actually that made 
besides the generality going through LLVM made, made many people like Clang uh, more than uh, the perception was that Clang will give you more efficient code than, yeah. than GCC. So I think the same could happen here, but imagine this, you just do it once. If you have a new programming language and the blockchain actually spaces lots of new uh, programming languages and innovation on that front, you have a new programming language, define the semantics once and you then get compilers, get formal verifiers, get everything and all the knowledge <laughs> Or a lot of the knowledge developed by the community, by the formal methods community, compiler community, all that is incorporated now in the framework. And, yeah. and as a normal user, we get all these benefits at once without having to redo all the tools, all the implementations, and at no cost, really. <laughs> On the contrary, actually, you can have all the benefits. Um, I think I think one thing I, you know, I, you know, at one end we have Clang, which is like an industry-ready tool, and, it, and we have K, which you know has some industry ready applications but i think we can meet in the middle honestly that the the what i was saying earlier about the summarizer producing a static analysis friendly summary you know clang the first thing that it's doing once it gets it into lvmir it's putting it into ssa form it's figuring out what the control flow graph looks like it's doing def use analysis it's doing all these analyses on an you know, a control flow graph that it builds internally with its own internal semantics of what LLVM is, right? And what SSA is and stuff like, and there's a bunch of proofs on paper of the soundness of these transformations. Well, you know, that's that's like, you know, starting here and just having a trust base that looks like this, right? If instead we feed as input the summarized definition of the program, maybe that's enough input that now we can remove this bit from the trust base of playing, but it's still doing its, you know, its other analysis on top of that or something. I mean, the ideal situation is you have the whole thing be done from a principled approach, right? But, uh, you know, there's momentum in the community and, and stuff like that it makes it harder. And also we can provide this information, you know, we can become a provider of this static analysis information to other users, if that makes sense, so. Yes, yes, all right. Thank you so much, Everett uh, and Nishant. Um, any other questions? Chahong, any question? Jan? So I do have I a comment on, on um, you know, this case summer is actually a very good uh, optimization for generating shorter proof certificates of programs, right? Because all the, the, the actual, the summary is actually, you know, it provides the, the, the lemmas, right? So, 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 the, so the summary uh, compiles the execution of all those basic blocks. And they are actually useful lemmas. And I use lemmas in my proof certificates to shorten the proofs. So that's uh, that's also very useful uh, in terms of um, you know guaranteeing the correctness of, of programs, right? And to generate shorter proof certificates. Yeah. Initially unexpected benefit, but as ever had said, this just shows us that we are on the right path. This is the right way to do things. When you get all these additional benefits that we didn't expect initially, there's just additional confidence that yes, that's how it yeah, should be done. <laughs> uh, kind of in the same vein of that, there's several projects which are trying to export K definitions to other logical frameworks like to Cock or to Isabel or to Ducty or something like that. You know, instead of exporting <laughs> the whole entire original semantics, export the summarized one for your program, you know, and you have a much smaller definition to work with at that point in the in Cock or something, right? And so then it becomes much more practical to actually use the other framework to do reasoning over that. And maybe maybe you don't care about the intermediate states in that other formalism, right? Maybe you only care about the end states or the points at the basic blocks or something like that. Then it's perfect, right? You you get yeah. the much more compact transition system. Yeah, most likely you don't mm -hmm. care about intermediate states because you want to prove that the program is correct. And uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Nishant, you wanted to say something? Um, I would say that uh, we can also use it to kind of, we, if you suppose you've got a uh, existing optimization, like a loop inversion or something like that in the compiler space, we could actually bring this to other spaces by like, you perform the loop inversion on the control flow graph, and then you can get that in other, other in the other domains you're working in, like uh, verification or um, the other tools that K provides as well. So and actually, that does make a lot of something sense. Something else like that would be interesting to the same control flow graph manipulation operations that LLVM mm -hmm. might be using internally to do loop inversion, we could probably apply to the generated mm -hmm. graph here. 
I don't know. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's nice when you end the meeting with more questions than answers because uh, <laughs> that means you're on the right track as well. So thank you so mm-hmm. much, uh, gentlemen. And um, I hope in one year or so we'll have another meeting like that and we'll show 25 languages <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, better compilers than the state of the art. Maybe not in a year, maybe two or three, but it will happen. It will happen. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.